ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to Buzzbacks Millennials and Nutrition Webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. However, you may submit questions at any time today by typing them through the chat feature located to the left of your screen. We'll be fielding questions at the end of the presentation. And as a reminder, today's call is being recorded and will be offered at the conclusion of our event of our event tomorrow. Um, so now I just want to take this time to introduce you to Martin Oxley. He's the Managing Director of Buzzback Europe. Martin has been managing uh, Buzzback Europe since its inception. In his 20 plus years in research, he's worked for two of the biggest global custom firms, Ipsos and TNS. And Martin is a recipient of a 2009 MRS Fellowship and a regular speaker and chair of MRS and ESMR events. Martin, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. It's um, only when you realize someone's introducing an, a, a bit of a nose bio that you realize that uh, nearly 20 years should be closer to nearly 30. So um, that definitely means that um, I'm not a millennial. So um, actually, I think some of you may be shocked that I'm not a millennial, but if you actually care to go and look at my LinkedIn profile, you're not going to be shocked that I'm not a millennial. But about a number of characteristics about me that means I'm not a millennial. So for one thing, like this gentleman on the screen in front of you, I don't have a beard. I don't know what it is about millennials, both uh, in the U.S. and in the U.K. It seems that beards, beards are back. And if, um, if I were Gillette, I'd be a little bit unhappy. But it's not just the fact that I don't have a beard and I'm much older than a millennial. It's also because I don't actually share some of the attitudinal views of this particular group. And how do I know this? Well, actually, there's a wonderful tool um, on the Pew Research Center, which I would encourage you to visit, that you can see hopefully on your screen now. And the Pew Research Center, which, as you know, is a very reputable uh, US-based organization, has this great sort of self-diagnosis tool. And you can go in there, and you can answer a series of questions, and then it'll pop up and tell you really attitudinally rather than demographically, whether you're a millennial or not. And as you can see from the screen in front of you, which is me, I'm very much right wedded as a Gen Xer, which is indeed where I am demographically. And I think this is an important thing. I would encourage you to have a play around with this and find out how millennial you are. Because one thing's for sure, being a millennial is more than a demographic, as I said. It really is a state of mind. And that's really what the rest of this presentation is going to be around, understanding that millennial state of mind when it comes to food and nutrition. But before I do that, I just thought I'd explain why we're sharing this work. Um, when I shared this um, preview with uh, some of my clients based in London, they said, you know, why are you doing this, Martin? And I thought I'd, I'd put this slide together to address it. Um, firstly, firstly, it's... Um, it's free food for thought. That's not an accidental pun. It's a deliberate pun. Um, you know, we can share this deck with you um, so you can use it for your own studies or to improve your existing studies. But for us as a business, it also starts a lot of conversations because one thing for sure, a study like the one I'm going to share with you is just the beginning. It's not the end of understanding such a diverse group. So why do they matter? Why does this generation born in 81 to 2000 mean so much to us? Well, a number of things you can see in front of you on the slide. Um, and I think the most important one, if you want to convince your boss or others, is that they are financially a very uh, lucrative target. You can see that they expect to spend more than $200 billion annually starting in 2017 and $10 trillion no one, I have no idea what a trillion is either, in their entire lifetime. So that's a, a huge figure, that horrible expression, eyes on the prize, um, you've got there on the left-hand side. But also, you know, we know they have a strong, engaging social media presence, something for me which was a revelation reading that they're younger than the web. They check their cell phones or mobile phones or smartphones or watches, I guess, increasingly with yesterday's Apple announcement more than 43 times a day. And in some pockets, it's even higher than that. This group is the digital, the digital native. 
Um, there are lots of them, as you can see, worldwide, 1.7 billion. And in some countries, they are really the dominant demographic. Look at India, for example. But I think importantly, it's that final point. They have a strong influence over other generations. And later, you'll see, they're also influenced by other generations. So they influence and are the influenced, which is, which is fascinating. And why are companies taking notice? Well, on the slide in front of you, you can see that there's a, a three key reasons as far as I can see. It's about their communications that are different, to, certainly to my generation. The conventional wisdom is that they're res less receptive to traditional advertising and marketing efforts, although that's not entirely true, as you'll see in, in a moment when I share some data. But I think it's this final thing. They have a, a unique set of considerations and factors um, that we need to take into account when trying to understand that group. And what's important about this, this generation is that they, they take their mindset, they take their attitudes with them across sectors. It's not just food and nutrition, but it's beauty, it's technology, it's fashion. So they are attitudinally a distinct group and worth focusing on. So today's presentation is going to be focusing on food and nutrition. And in the 20 minutes or so I have available, as you can appreciate, I can only touch upon some of this. But I'm going to focus on the four key areas that are on this slide at the bottom. What's important to them when it comes to food? Do they actually do what they say? Do they eat what they purport to eat? What kinds of things are they shopping for? And finally, you know, who and what influences them? Who do they trust? And as a bit of a spoiler, I'm afraid, for many of you on the uh, in the audience today, it's not you. If you're a food manufacturer, I'm afraid you're pretty low to the bottom in terms of the trust index we developed at the end of the, the presentation. So, so what did we do? How did we look at this particular group? Well, we did a, a study um, earlier in the year, both online together with a mobile phone diary with 600 millennials in the UK and in the US. And we did a mixture of video, photos, and some more standard questions to try and get below the surface of this particular group. Because as we know, perceptions typically trump behaviors, but we're interested in understanding both. So the first bit of data here on the screen in front of you, what is evident? is the millennials are looking for new experiences. Now, those experiences are bounded by some constraints, and we'll talk about that later. So it's not a, any kind of new experience. But when you compare it to my generation, to Gen X, which is in the slide here, you can see that their agreement with the statement, I'm constantly looking for new ways to entertain myself, 63% endorse that versus 35 for, for my generation. So, that's both at an absolutely high level and also relative to this other generation. So new forms of entertainment. I like to stay on the cutting edge of the latest design and technology. And interestingly, the last one here, I like to impress people with my lifestyle, food, drinks, and fashion. It's sort of like the badge. It's external projection. It's not just about me. It's about what I say about me to the world by the things that I consume. But food experience is a key component of that. And food experience is one of the key elements that they're looking for. And this slide here, for me, is either incredibly profound or blindingly obvious. And actually, I think it's more the former than the latter. So we ask consumers how important are each of these following things to them personally when thinking about food and nutrition. You can see the question at the bottom of your screen. And right at the top is taste, food experience, quality. These things are right up there. And the things that are more about the components, protein, fat, sugar, calories, are not unimportant, but they're very much second tier. And then finally, some of these other constituents that I'm sure you are debating constantly within your business around you know, GM, local macronutrients, these are really low down. It's not to say they're unimportant, but it's about taste stupid, to use an expression. It's like the economy stupid when it comes to voting. Taste is right up there. 
And as you'll see later when we start to unpack what nutrition means, you'll see that taste is rarely related to that. So 